Yes, indeedy, folks. It's the Beer Drinker's Guide to the Great Wahoo. All right, already. I know that they sell oil by the barrel. And I also know that except in very small pockets of the world, it's been close to a hundred years since oil has been put in barrels to be shipped or stored. So how did it come about that we call a quantity of oil a barrel? It's kind of an interesting story. Let's check it out. Using oil goes way back, at least, if not earlier, than 347 current era, the Chinese were using oil to burn brine down into salt. By the 10th century, or the 1900s, China had built vast bamboo pipelines to move oil and gas from wellheads to salt fields. In the West, we were mostly taking tar pits and places where oil naturally came to the surface and soaking it up with rags, wringing the rags out, and selling it for medicinal purposes. This oil was called rock oil. They had oils from fishes and whales and from grains. So, since this was coming from the rocks, this oil was called rock oil. The Greek for rock oil is literally petr and oleum, rock and oil, and that is how we got the name petroleum. Most people's lighting was done by oil that was taken from whales. However, by the mid-1800s, the whaling industry was beginning to run out of whales. A new source for light was founded in 1846 when Abraham Gessner learned how to make kerosene from coal. Six years later, in 1852, Ignacy Lukasevich, and your guess is as good as mine on pronouncing that one, learned how to make kerosene from rock oil, a much more efficient way to make kerosene than coal. Two years later, in 1854, Benjamin Silliman learned how to fractionate petroleum by distillation. Whale oil was getting scarce and expensive. Kerosene was getting less expensive and more abundant. People got frantic about trying to sop up more and more oil with rags. With demand for oil growing, the Seneco Oil Company sent a man named Edwin Drake up to the northwest corner of Pennsylvania where there was a lot of rock oil. His mission was to attempt to drill for oil to see if he could not find a more abundant and reliable supply. People were drilling for salt brine at this time and Drake hired a salt driller to come and drill his well for him. Here we have a replica of Drake's well at the Drake Well Museum in Pennsylvania. Drake's well found oil at 69 feet in 1859. Originally, the well produced 25 barrels a day. By the end of the year, that had gone down to 15 barrels a day. Drake's well is recognized as the birthplace of the modern petroleum industry. But how to ship the oil around? They couldn't just ship it around in buckets, so they turned to the wooden barrels that were common for shipping most other items. These wooden barrels came in many shapes and sizes for many different products, and the oil industry used them all. Here we have a photograph from Pennsylvania of about 1862. These two wells are two different men's wells, the Phillips well and the Woodford well. Not only are these wells awfully close together, you'll notice that the barrels laying around in the background that they are using for shipping oil 
are of all different sizes. Having learned how to drill for oil, it got to where the production of oil in Pennsylvania was so abundant that the market fell out from under the producers. At one point, the barrels were worth twice what the oil inside them was worth. It was the rugged west, and these were oil drillers, and the one thing that they had more barrels of than anything else were whiskey barrels. The whiskey barrel was 40 gallons. As more and more oil was shipped, the Pennsylvania petroleum producers decided that they really needed to have a standard measure of oil so that people that were getting their oil would know that they were getting a fair and proper amount. Because whiskey barrels were so popular, they decided to standardize the oil barrel at the size of a whiskey barrel. However, they wanted their customers to feel that they were always getting the right amount and if there was a discrepancy, it was to the customer's favor. For that reason, they standardized the oil barrel at 42 gallons. Of course, it wasn't long before the roads were congested with too much traffic trying to move these barrels around and we began building pipelines. These pipelines, which were made of wood, made it possible for 25-year-old John D. Rockefeller to form what became Standard Oil. By 1911, Standard Oil controlled 90% of U.S. oil refining. President Teddy Roosevelt used his influence to break up 40 large monolithic corporations that he felt were hampering the progress of the country. On May 15, 1911, Standard Oil joined the group. The company was broken into 34 independent companies, many of which are still with us. Soon after the pipelines were laid throughout the Northeast in the late 1870s and early 1880s, the first oil tankers were passing through the Suez Canal. The modern transportation of oil had begun, and today nobody uses barrels. However, the barrel is the world standard for a quantity of oil. Today, tankers hold up to 4 million barrels of oil. Daily world consumption is at 85 million barrels. These figures mean that about a third of all international cargo is oil. Oil is also measured by metric tons and by kiloliters. However, when it is being traded and priced, it is converted to the barrel simply because early pioneers in the field loved to drink their whiskey. Let's get into Old McDonald's overalls and play E-I-E-I-O. It's East Idaho, East Idaho, wow. It's not a very long drive, folks, and there are some mighty interesting things to check out over on the great eastern side of Idaho. In past exciting episodes of EIEIO, we've been looking at the upper end of the eastern Idaho area, including the beautiful Teton Valley and the Henry's Fork of the Snake River. some truly stunning country, including Upper and Lower Mesa Falls and Big Springs. In our last episode, we drove down to Pocatello, and today we're gonna to drive south from Pocatello to a place called 
Red Rock Pass. To get to Red Rock Pass, we take Interstate 15 down to US 91. On the interstate, we pass beautiful downtown Pocatello. The interstate pretty much follows the Portneuf River Valley. It heads south and east for about five miles before turning pretty much due east for another five miles and then due south down toward Utah. we get off the freeway and onto US 91 heading over to Red Rock Pass.
After some five or six miles, we see in the distance the first glimpse of what will become Red Rock Pass. The road is going to turn and go through the little niche in the hills just before the light tan hillside in the distance. Red Rock Pass was discovered a long time ago, a major artery between Utah and eastern Idaho. Wagon roads have long come through here. The railroad built its artery through here, and, as you can see, it's very popular with the power company as well. Just to the west of the pass itself is this knoll. On the east side of the pass, we see this knoll. And right in between the two knolls is this mound of earth. At the base of this mound of earth is an Idaho scenic attraction. It is at this spot washing around these two banks on either side of where the road goes through Red Rock Pass that the second largest flood in the geologic record of the world was released on the Snake River Plain. Today we call this the Great Salt Lake. 14,000 years ago the area was much more wet, and Lake Bonneville was much more substantial. If the shoreline of Lake Bonneville had been stretched out in a straight line, it would have reached to New Orleans. It happened that on one of the northern arms of the great Lake Bonneville, there was an earthen fill or dam that held the lake back. This fill was made of relatively soft materials that, once the water began to erode it away, it collapsed quite quickly. The fill was 300 feet high, and it was about three quarters of a mile wide. By comparison, this is about the same height as the water level gets in Lucky Peak Dam, and it's about three times as wide as the main fill at Lucky Peak. There are a couple of theories as to what happened when the fill gave way, and we'll look into those in another show. Just let it say that within a very short time, a matter of days if that, the fill washed out, and 300 feet by three-quarter mile wide began flooding toward the Snake River. If this happened at Lucky Peak, it would make a terrible flood and it would last a short while. Lake Bonneville drained about as much water as half of Lake Michigan, five times as much water as Lake Erie. There are different estimates as to how much water was flowing when, but it is generally agreed that there was a major large flow for some three months. For the next three months, the Snake River ran as much water as three times the flow of the Amazon River today. In the Snake River Canyon at Twin Falls, the river was running over the top of the walls. Today, when you look at the hills above Salt Lake Valley, you can see two very distinct major ancient shorelines. 
The upper shoreline was left by Lake Bonneville. The lower of the two shorelines is called the Provo shoreline. The lower shoreline corresponds with where we stand here at Red Rock Pass. The lake stayed at this shoreline from about 14,500 years ago until about 8,000 years ago when the climate got drier and the lake began to evaporate into its current shape. We can only imagine what it was like for that three months as the water tore around this little mound in the middle of Red Rock Pass. So let's walk up this steep little stairway that they've built to the top of this mound, shall we? It's a rather exciting climb with no handrails. There's beautiful fauna to enjoy. And once you get to the top, a rather elaborate pavement over to a monument. The monument commemorates Captain Jefferson Hunt, a Mormon church pioneer. And the top of the mound offers an excellent view of the surrounding countryside. Going down the stairway without any rails looks even spookier than coming up. So I find a nice little trail down the back of the hill. Here behind some substantial juniper bushes we find a small cemetery. On closer inspection we find that this small cemetery holds the remains of Jefferson Hunt and members of the Hunt family. The stories of the greatest floods in the history of the geologic record are fascinating stories indeed. What makes them even more so is that both of them happened because of collapsing dams at opposite ends of this bizarre state we call Idaho. The emptying of 300 feet of Lake Bonneville was monumental indeed. And if the word monumental describes what happened at Red Rock Pass, what happened at Clark Fork can only be described by the word colossal. Just to give us an idea, let's take a look at this graph. On this graph, the main fill at Lucky Peak Reservoir would be represented by this much of a square. What washed out at Red Rock Pass to make the Bonneville flood was about the same height as Lucky Peak and three times as wide. It would be represented 
by this little cube. If this represents what happened when Red Rock Pass opened up and caused the Bonneville flood, then what happened at Clark Fork is what happens when a dam this big lets go all at once. Both these floods are fascinating stories. We'll be taking the next show or two to take a good look at them, since I can't do justice to them in just one show. If you're interested in this sort of thing, make sure you check it out. When we go check the record that was written in stone and look at the world's greatest floods. A gentleman was at a fun cocktail party and noticed a lady sitting by herself. So he went over and began chatting. As soon as he caught a glimpse of her hands, he couldn't help but just exclaiming, Oh my, what an amazing diamond! Oh yes, she replied as she lifted up her ring for him to take a good look. It really is beautiful, isn't it? Actually, it's the Kleinschmidt diamond, she told him. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it comes with a terrible curse. Well, the gentleman was certainly fascinated by that story, and he asked her just what is the curse. She replied, Mr. Kleinschmidt. And that's this week's Beer Drinker's Guide to the Great Wahoo. Thanks for watching. See you next week. And in the meantime, keep celebrating the Great Wahoo!